Chapter Eleven of Kidnapped. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Kidnapped, by Robert Louis Stevenson, Chapter Eleven, The Captain Knuckles Under. Alan and I sat down to breakfast about six of the clock. The floor was covered with broken glass and in a horrid mess of blood, which took away my hunger. In all other ways we were in a situation not only agreeable but merry, having ousted the officers from their own cabin, and having at command all the drink in the ship, both wine and spirits, and all the dainty part of what was eatable, such as the pickles and the fine sort of bread. This of itself was enough to set us in good humour, but the richest part of it was this, that the two thirstiest men that ever came out of Scotland, Mr. Shuan being dead, were now shut in the fore part of the ship, and condemned to what they hated most, cold water. "'And depend upon it,' Alan said, "'we shall hear more of them ere long. You may keep a man from the fighting, but never from his bottle.' We made good company for each other. Alan, indeed, expressed himself most lovingly, and, taking a knife from the table, cut me off one of the silver buttons from his coat. "'I had them,' says he, "'from my father, Duncan Stewart, and I'll give you one of them to be a keepsake for last night's work. And wherever you go and show that button, the friends of Alan Breck will come around you.' He said this as if he had been Charlemagne, and commanded armies and indeed, much as I admired his courage, I was always in danger of smiling at his vanity. In danger, I say, for had I not kept my countenance, I would be afraid to think what a quarrel might have followed. As soon as we were through with our meal he rummaged in the captain's locker, till he found a clothes-brush, and then, taking off his coat, began to visit his suit and brush away the stains with such care and labour as I supposed to have been only usual with women. To be sure, he had no other, and, besides, as he said, it belonged to a king, and so behooved to be royally looked after. For all that, when I saw what care he took to pluck out the threads where the button had been cut away, I put a higher value on his gift. He was still so engaged when we were hailed by Mr. Riach from the deck asking for a parley, and I, climbing through the skylight and sitting on the edge of it, pistol in hand and with a bold front, though inwardly in fear of broken glass, hailed him back again and bade him speak out. He came to the edge of the roundhouse and stood on a coil of rope, so that his chin was on a level with the roof, and we looked at each other a while in silence. Mr. Riach, as I do not think he had been very forward in the battle, so he had got off with nothing worse than a blow upon the cheek. But he looked out of heart, and very weary, having been all night afoot, either standing watch or doctoring the wounded. "'This is a bad job,' said he at last, shaking his head. "'It was none of our choosing,' said I. "'The captain,' says he, "'would like to speak with your friend. They might speak at the window.' "'And how do we know what treachery he means?' cried I. "'He means none, David,' returned Mr. Riach. "'And if he did, I'll tell you the honest truth. We could not get the men to follow.' "'Is that so?' said I. "'I'll tell you more than that,' said he. "'It's not only the men. It's me. I'm fritchened, Davy.' And he smiled across at me. No, he continued, what we want is to be shut of him. Thereupon I consulted with Alan, and the parley was agreed to and parole given upon either side, but this was not the whole of Mr. Riach's business, and he now begged me for a dram with such instancy and such reminders of his former kindness that at last I handed him a pannikin with about half a gill of brandy. He drank a part and then carried the rest down upon the deck to share it, I suppose, with his superior. A little after the captain came, as was agreed, to one of the windows, and stood there in the rain with his arm in a sling, and looking stern and pale, 
and so old that my heart smote me for having fired upon him. Alan at once held a pistol in his face. "'Put that thing up,' said the captain. "'Have I not passed my word, sir, or do you seek to affront me?' "'Captain,' says Alan, "'I doubt your word is a-breakable. Last night you haggled and argle-bargled like an apple-wife, and then passed me your word, and gave me your hand to back it. And you ken very well what was the upshot. Be damned to your word, says he. Well, well, sir, said the captain, you'll get little good by swearing. And truly that was a fault of which the captain was quite free. But we have other things to speak, he continued bitterly. You've made a sore hash of my brig. I haven't hands enough left to work her, and my first officer, whom I could ill spare, has got your swords throughout his vitals and passed without speech. There is nothing left me, sir, but to put back into the port of Glasgow after hands, and there, by your leave, you shall find them that are better able to talk to you. I said Alan, and faith, I'll have a talk with them myself. Unless there's nobody speaks English in that town, I have a bunny tail for them. Fifteen tarry sailors upon the one side, and a man and a halfling boy upon the other. Oh, man, it's pitiful. Hoseason flushed red. No, continued Alan, that'll no do. You'll just have to set me ashore as we agreed. Aye, said Hoseason, but my first officer is dead. You ken best how. There's none of the rest of us acquainted with this coast, sir, and it's one very dangerous to ships. I give you your choice, says Alan. Set me on dry ground in Appen, or Ardgour, or in Morven, or Eraseg, or Morar, or in brief, where you please, within thirty miles of my own country, except in a country of the Campbells. That's a broad target. If you miss that, you must be as feckless at the sailoring as I have found ye at the fighting. Why, my poor country people in their bit cobbles pass from island to island in all weathers, ay, and by night too, for the matter of that. A cobble's not a ship, sir, said the captain. It is no draught of water. Well, then, to Glasgow if ye list, says Alan. We'll have the laugh of ye at the least. My mind runs little upon laughing, said the captain. But all this will cost money, sir. Well, sir, says Alan, I am no weather cock. Thirty guineas if you land me on the seaside, and sixty if you put me in the linny lock. But see, sir, where we lie. We are but a few hours' sail from Arden American, says Hoseason. Give me sixty, and I'll set you there. And I'm to wear my brogues and run jeopardy of the redcoats to please you? cries Alan. No, sir, if you want sixty guineas, earn them, and set me in my own country. It's to risk the brig, sir, said the captain, and your own lives along with her. Take it or want it, says Alan. Could you pilot us at all? asked the captain, who was frowning to himself. Well, it's doubtful, said Alan. I'm more of a fighting man, as you have seen for yourself, than a sailor man, but I have been often enough picked up and set down upon this coast, and should ken something of the lie of it." The captain shook his head, still frowning. "'If I had lost less money on this unchancy cruise,' says he, "'I would see you in a rope's end before I risk my brig, sir. But be it as you will. As soon as I get a slant of wind, and there's some coming, or I'm the more mistaken, I'll put it in hand. But there's one thing more. We may meet in with the king's ship, and she may lay us aboard, sir, with no blame of mine. They keep the cruisers thick upon this coast, ye ken who for. Now, sir, if that was to befall, ye might leave the money. Captain, says Alan, if ye see a pennant, it shall be your part to run away. And now, as I hear you are little short of brandy in the forepart, I'll offer ye a change, a bottle of brandy against two buckets of water. That was the last clause of the treaty, and was duly executed on both sides, so that Alan and I could at last wash out the roundhouse and be quit of the memorials of those whom we had slain, 
and the captain and Mr. Riach could be happy again in their own way, the name of which was Drink. End of chapter Chapter Twelve of Kidnapped. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. Chapter Twelve I Hear of the Red Fox. Before we had done cleaning out the roundhouse, a breeze sprang up from a little to the east of north. This blew off the rain and brought out the sun. And here I must explain, and the reader would do well to look at a map. On the day when the fog fell and we ran down Allen's boat, we had been running through the little minch. At dawn after the battle, we lay becalmed to the east of the Isle of Canna, or between that and Isle Eriska in the chain of the Long Island. Now to get from there to the Linny Lock, the straight course was through the narrows of the Sound of Mull. But the captain had no chart. He was afraid to trust his brig so deep among the islands, and the wind serving well, he preferred to go by west of Tyree and come up under the southern coast of the great Isle of Mull. All day the breeze held in the same point, and rather freshened than died down, and towards afternoon a swell began to set in from round the outer Hebrides. Our course, to go round about the inner isles, was to the west of south, so that at first we had the swell upon our beam, and were much rolled about. But after nightfall, when we had turned the end of Tyree and began to head more to the east, the sea came right astern. Meanwhile, the early part of the day, before the swell came up, was very pleasant, sailing as we were in a bright sunshine and with many mountainous islands upon different sides. Alan and I sat in the roundhouse with the doors open on each side, the wind being straight astern, and smoked a pipe or two of the captain's fine tobacco. It was at this time we heard each other's stories, which was the more important to me, as I gained some knowledge of that wild highland country on which I was so soon to land. In those days, so close on the back of the great rebellion, it was needful a man should know what he was doing when he went upon the heather. It was I that showed the example, telling him all my misfortune, which he heard with great good nature. Only when I came to mention that good friend of mine, Mr. Campbell, the minister, Alan fired up and cried out that he hated all that were of that name. Why, said I, he is a man you should be proud to give your hand to. "'I know nothing I would help a Campbell to,' says he, "'unless it was a leaden bullet. I would hunt all of that name like black cocks. If I lay dying I would crawl upon my knees to my chamber window for a shot at one.' "'Why, Alan,' I cried, "'what ails ye at the Campbells?' "'Well,' says he, "'ye ken very well that I am an appin Stuart and the Campbells have long harried and wasted those of my name, ay, and got lands of us by treachery, but never with the sword," he cried loudly, and with the word brought down his fist upon the table. But I paid the less attention to this, for I knew it was usually said by those who have the underhand. "'There's more than that,' he continued, "'in all in the same story. Lying words, lying papers, tricks fit for a peddler, and the show of what's legal over all, to make a man the more angry. "'You are so wasteful of your buttons,' said I, "'I can hardly think you would be a good judge of business.' "'Ha! Ah, says he, falling again to smiling, "'I got my wastefulness from the same man I got the buttons from, "'and that was my poor father, Duncan Stewart, grace be to him. "'He was the prettiest man of his kindred, "'and the best swordsman in the Highlands, David,' and that is the same as to say, in all the world I should ken, for it was him that taught me. He was in the black watch, when first it was mustered, and like other gentlemen privates had a gilly at his back to carry his firelock for him on the march. Well, the king, it appears, was wishful to see Highland swordsmanship, 
and my father and three more were chosen out and sent to London town, to let him see it at the best. So they were had into the palace, and showed the whole art of the sword for two hours at a stretch, before King George and Queen Carline, and the butcher Cumberland, and many more of whom I have no mind. And when they were through, the king, for all he was a rank usurper, spoke them fair, and gave each man three guineas in his hand. Now, as they were going out of the palace, they had a porter's lodge to go by, and it came in on my father, as he was perhaps the first private Highland gentleman that had ever gone by that door. It was right he should give the poor porter a proper notion of their quality. So he gives the king's three guineas into the man's hand, as if it was his common custom. The three others that came behind him did the same, and there they were on the street, never a penny the better for their pains. Some say it was one that was the first to fee the king's porter, and some say it was another. But the truth of it is that it was Duncan Stuart, as I am willing to prove with either sword or pistol, and that was the father I had. God rest him. I think he was not the man to leave you rich, said I. And that's true, said Dallin. He left me my breeks to cover me, and little besides and that was how I came to enlist, which was a black spot upon my character at the best of times, and would still be a sore job for me if I fell among the redcoats. "'What?' cried I. "'Were you in the English army?' "'That was I,' said Alan. "'But I deserted to the right side at Preston Pans, and that's some comfort.' I could scarcely share this view, holding desertion under arms for an unpardonable fault in honour but for all I was so young, I was wiser than say my thought. "'Dear, dear,' says I, "'the punishment is death.' "'Aye,' said he, "'if they got the hands on me, it would be a short shrift and a long tow for Alan. But I have the King of France's commission in my pocket, which would I be some protection.' "'I misdoubt it much,' said I. "'I have doubts myself.' said Alan dryly. "'And good heaven, man,' cried I, "'you that are a condemned rebel, and a deserter, and a man of the French kings, what tempts you back into this country? It's a braving of providence.' "'Tut,' says Alan, "'I have been back every year since forty six. "'And what brings you, man?' cried I. "'Well, you see, I weary for my friends and country,' said he. France is a broad place, no doubt, but I weary for the heather and the deer, and then I have bit things that I attend to. Whilst I pick up a few lads to serve the King of France, recruits, you see, and that's I a little money. But the heart of the matter is the business of my chief, Ardshiel. I thought they called your chief Appen, said I. Aye, but Ardshiel is the captain of the clan, said he, which scarcely cleared my mind. You see, David, he that was all his life so great a man, and come of the blood and bearing the name of kings, is now brought down to live in a French town like a poor and private person. He that had four hundred swords at his whistle, I have seen, with these eyes of mine, buying butter in the market-place, and taking it home in a kale-leaf. This is not only a pain, but a disgrace to us of his family and clan. There are the barns forby, the children and the hope of Appen, that must be learned their letters and how to hold a sword in that far country. Now, the tenants of Appen have to pay a rent to King George, but their hearts are staunch, they are true to their chief, and what with love and a bit of pressure, and maybe a threat or two, the poor folks scrape up a second rent for Ardshiel. Well, David, I'm the hand that carries it and he struck the belt about his body, so that the guineas rang. "'Do they pay both?' cried I. "'Ay, David, both,' says he. "'What, two rents?' I repeated. "'Ay, David,' said he. "'I told a different tale to young Captain Man, but this is the truth of it, and it's wonderful to me how little pressure is needed. But that's the handiwork of my good kinsman and my father's friend, James of the Glens.' James Stuart, that is, Ardshiel's half-brother. 
He it is that gets the money in, and does the management." This was the first time I heard the name of that James Stewart, who was afterwards so famous at the time of his hanging. But I took little heed at the moment, for all my mind was occupied with the generosity of these poor Highlanders. "'I call it noble!' I cried. "'I'm a Whig, or little better, but I call it noble!' "'Aye,' said he, "'you're a Whig, but you're a gentleman, and that's what does it. Now, if you were one of the cursed race of Campbell, you would gnash your teeth to hear tell of it. If you were the Red Fox—' And at that name his teeth shut together, and he ceased speaking. I've seen many a grim face, but never a grimmer than Alan's when he had named the Red Fox. "'And who is the Red Fox?' I asked, daunted but still curious. "'Who is he?' cried Alan. "'Well, and I tell you that. When the men of the clans were broken at Culloden, and the good cause went down, and the horses rode over the fetlocks in the best blood of the north, Ardshiel had to flee like a poor deer upon the mountains, he and his lady and his bairns. A sad job we had of it before we got him shipped, and while he still lay in the heather, the English rogues, that couldn't have come at his life, were striking at his rights. They stripped him of his powers, they stripped him of his lands, they plucked the weapons from the hands of his clansmen, that had borne arms for thirty centuries, aye, and the very clothes off their backs, so that it's now a sin to wear a tartan plaid, and a man may be cast into a jail if he has but a kilt about his legs. One thing they couldn't kill, that was the love the clansmen bore their chief. These guineas are the proof of it. And now, in there steps a man, a Campbell, red-headed Colin of Glenure. "'Is that him you call the Red Fox?' said I. "'Will you bring me his brush?' cried Alan fiercely. "'Ay, that's the man. In he steps, and gets papers from King George, to be so-called King's Factor on the lands of Appen. And at first he sings small, and his hail-fellow well met with Seamus. That's James of the Glens, my chieftain's agent. But by the by, that came to his ears that I have just told you, how the poor commons of Appen, the farmers and the crofters and the bowmen, were ringing the very plaids to get a second rent, and send it overseas for Ardshiel and his poor bairns. What was it you called it, when I told you? I called it noble, Alan, said I. I knew little better than a common wig, cries Alan. And when it came to Colin Roy, the black Campbell blood in him ran wild. He sat gnashing his teeth at the wine-table. What? Should a Stuart get a bite of bread, and him not be able to prevent it? Ha! Red Fox, if ever I hold you at a gun's end, the Lord have pity upon ye. Alan stopped to swallow down his anger. Well, David, what does he do? He declares all the farms to let, and, thinks he in his black heart, I'll soon get other tenants that are overbid these Stuarts, and Maccalls, and Maccrubs, for these are all names in my clan, David. And then, thinks he, Ardshiel will have to hold his bonnet on a French roadside. Well, said I, what followed? Alan laid down his pipe, which he had long since suffered to go out, and set his two hands upon his knees. Aye, said he, you never guess that. For well, these same Stuarts, and Maccalls, and Maccrubs, that had two rents to pay, one to King George by stark force, and one to Ardshiel by natural kindness, offered him a better price than any Campbell in all broad Scotland, and far he sent seeking them, as far as to the sides of Clyde and the Cross of Edinburgh, seeking and fleeching and begging them to come, where there was a Stuart to be starved and a red-headed hound of a Campbell to be pleasured. "'Well, Alan,' said I, "'that is a strange story, and a fine one, too. And Whig as I may be, I am glad the man was beaten.' "'Him beaten?' echoed Alan. "'It's little ye ken of Campbell's, and less of the Red Fox. Him beaten? No, nor will be, till his blood's on the hillside. But if the day comes, David Mann, that I can find time and leisure for a bit of hunting, 
There grows not enough heather in all Scotland to hide him from my vengeance. Man, Alan, said I, you are neither very wise nor very Christian to blow off so many words of anger. They will do the man you call the fox no harm, and yourself no good. Tell me your tale plainly out. What did he next? And that's a good observe, David, said Alan. Trothen, indeed, they will do him no harm, the more's the pity. And barring that about Christianity, of which my opinion is quite otherwise, or I would be no Christian, I am much of your mind. Opinion here, or, or opinion there, said I, it's a Kent thing that Christianity forbids revenge. Ay, said he, it's well seen it was a Campbell taught ye. It would be a convenient world for them and their sort, if there were no such thing as a lad and a gun behind a heather bush. But that's nothing to the point. This is what he did. Ay, said I, come to that. Well, David, said he, since he couldn't be rid of the loyal commons by fair means, he swore he would be rid of them by foul. Ardshiel was to starve, that was the thing he aimed at, and since them that fed him in his exile would not be brought out, right or wrong, he would drive them out. Therefore he sent for lawyers, and papers, and redcoats to stand at his back, and the kindly folk of that country must all pack and trap every father's son out of his father's house, and out of the place where he was bred and fed, and played when he was a callant. And who are to succeed them? Bare-legged beggars! King George is to whistle for his rents, he mon do with less, he can spread his butter thinner. What cares Red Colin? If he can hurt Ardshiel, he has his wish. If he can pluck the meat from my chieftain's table, and the bit toys out of his children's hands, he will gang home singing to Glenure. Let me have a word, said I. Be sure, if they take less rents, be sure government has a finger in the pie. It's not this Campbell's fault, man. It's his orders. And if you killed this Colin to-morrow, what better would you be? There would be another factor in his shoes, as fast as Spur can drive. You're a good lad at a fight, said Alan. But, man, you have Whig blood in you. He spoke kindly enough, but there was so much anger under his contempt that I thought it was wise to change the conversation. I expressed my wonder how, with the highlands covered with troops, and guarded like a city in a siege, a man in his situation could come and go without arrest. "'It's easier than you would think,' said Alan. "'A bare hillside, you see, is like all one road. If there's a sentry at one place you just go by another. And then the heather's a great help and everywhere there are friends' houses and friends' byres and haystacks. And besides, when folk talk of a country covered with troops, it's but a kind of a byword at the best. A soldier covers no more of it than his boot-soles. I have fished a water with a sentry on the other side of the brae, and killed a fine trout, and I have sat in a heather-bush within six feet of another, and learned a real bonny tune from his whistling. This was it," said he and whistled me the air. "'And then, besides,' he continued, "'it's no so bad now as it was in forty-six. The highlands are what they call pacified. Small wonder, with never a gun or a sword left from Kentire to Cape Wrath, but what tenty folk have hidden in the thatch. But what I would like to ken, David, is just how long. Not long, you would think, with men like Hardshiel in exile, and men like the Red Fox, sitting burling the wine and oppressing the poor at home. But it's a kittle thing to decide what folks will bear, and what they will not. And why would Red Colin be riding his horse all over my poor country of Appen, and never a pretty lad to put a bullet in him?" And with this Alan fell into a muse, and for a long time sat very sad and silent. I will add the rest of what I have to say about my friend, that he was skilled in all kinds of music, but principally pipe music, was a well-considered poet in his own tongue, had read several books both in French and English, was a dead shot, a good angler, and an excellent fencer with the small sword, as well as with his own particular weapon. For his faults they were on his face, and I now knew them all. 
but the worst of them, his childish propensity to take offence and to pick quarrels, he greatly laid aside in my case, out of regard for the battle of the roundhouse. But whether it was because I had done well myself, or because I had been a witness of his own much greater prowess, is more than I can tell. For though he had a great taste for courage in other men, yet he admired it most in Alan Breck. End of chapter Chapter Thirteen of Kidnapped. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. Chapter Thirteen The Loss of the Brig. It was already late at night and as dark as ever would be at that season of the year, and that is to say it was still pretty bright, when Hoseason clapped his head into the roundhouse door. "'Here,' said he, "'come out and see if you can pilot.' "'Is this one of your tricks?' asked Alan. "'Do I look like tricks?' cries the captain. "'I have other things to think of. My brig's in danger.' By the concerned look of his face, and above all by the sharp tones in which he spoke of his brig, it was plain to both of us he was in deadly earnest, and so Alan and I, with no great fear of treachery, stepped on deck. The sky was clear, it blew hard, and it was bitter cold. A great deal of daylight lingered, and the moon, which was nearly full, shone brightly. The brig was close-hauled, so as to round the southwest corner of the island of Mull, the hills of which, and Ben Moore above them all, with a wisp of mist upon the top of it, lay full upon the larboard bow. Though it was no good point of sailing for the Covenant, she tore through the seas at a great rate, pitching and straining, and pursued by the westerly swell. Altogether it was no such ill night to keep the seas in, and I had begun to wonder what it was that sat so heavily upon the captain, when the brig rising suddenly on the top of a high swell, he pointed and cried to us to look. Away on the lee bow, a thing like a fountain rose out of the moonlit sea, and immediately after we heard a low sound of roaring. "'What do you call that?' asked the captain, gloomily. "'The sea breaking on a reef,' said Alan. "'And now you ken where it is, and what better would you have?' "'Aye,' said Hoseason if it was the only one. And sure enough, just as he spoke, there came a second fountain farther to the south. There, said Hoseason, you see for yourself. If I had kent of these reefs, if I had had a chart, or if Shuan had been spared, it's not sixty guineas, no, nor six hundred, would have made me risk my brig in such a stone-yard. And you, sir, that was to pilot us, have you never a word? I'm thinking said Alan, that these will be what they call the Torin rocks. "'Are there many of them?' says the captain. "'Truly, sir, I am no pilot,' said Alan. "'But it sticks in my mind there are ten miles of them.' Mr. Riach and the captain looked at each other. "'There's a way through them, I suppose,' said the captain. "'Doubtless,' said Alan. "'But where?' but it somehow runs in my mind once more that it is clearer under the land. So, said Hoseason, we'll have to haul our wind then, Mr. Riach. We'll have to come as near in about the end of Mull as we can take her, sir, and even then we'll have the land to keep the wind off us, and that stone-yard on our lee. Well, we're in for it now, and may as well crack on. With that he gave an order to the steersman, and sent Riach to the foretop. There were only five men on deck, counting the officers, these being all that were fit, or at least both fit and willing, for their work. So, as I said, it fell to Mr. Riach to go aloft, and he sat there looking out and hailing the deck with news of all he saw. "'The sea to the south is thick,' he cried, and then, after a while, "'It does seem clearer in by the land.' "'Well, sir,' said Hoseas and Alan, will try your way of it, but I think I might as well trust to a blind fiddler. Pray God you're right. 
"'Pray God I am,' said Alan to me. "'But where did I hear it?' "'Well, well, it will be as it must.' As we got nearer to the turn of the land, the reefs began to be sown here and there on our very path. Mr. Riach sometimes cried down to us to change the course. Sometimes, indeed, none too soon, for one reef was so close on the brig's weatherboard that when a sea burst upon it the lighter sprays fell upon her deck and wetted us like rain. The brightness of the night showed us these perils as clearly as by day, which was perhaps the more alarming. It showed me, too, the face of the captain as he stood by the steersman, now on one foot, now on the other, and sometimes blowing in his hands, but still listening and looking, and as steady as steel. Neither he nor Mr. Riach had shown well in the fighting, but I saw they were brave in their own trade, and admired them all the more because I found Alan very white. "'Achon, David,' says he, "'this is no the kind of death I fancy.' "'What, Alan?' I cried. "'You're not afraid?' "'No,' said he, wetting his lips. "'But you'll allow yourself. It's a cold ending.' By this time, now and then shearing to one side or the other to avoid a reef, but still hugging the wind and the land, we had got round Iona and begun to come alongside Mull. The tide at the tail of the land ran very strong and threw the brig about. Two hands were put to the helm, and Hoseason himself would sometimes lend a help, and it was strange to see three strong men throw their weight upon the tiller, and it, like a living thing, struggle against and drive them back. This would have been the greater danger had not the sea been for some while free of obstacles. Mr. Riach, besides, announced from the top that he saw clear water ahead. "'You are right,' said Hoseason to Alan. You have saved the brig, sir. I'll mind that when we come to clear accounts. And I believe he not only meant what he said, but he would have done it, so high a place did the covenant hold in his affections. But this is matter only for conjecture, things having gone otherwise than he forecast. "'Keep her away a point,' sings out Mr. Riach. "'Reef to windward!' And just at the same time the tide caught the brig, and threw the wind out of her sails. She came to round into the wind like a top, and the next moment struck the reef with such a crunch as threw us all flat upon the deck, and came near to shake Mr. Riach from his place upon the mast. I was on my feet in a minute. The reef on which we had struck was close in under the southwest end of Mull, off a little isle they call Ehraid, which lay low and black upon the larboard. Sometimes the swell broke clean over us, Sometimes it only ground the poor brig upon the reef, so that we could hear her beat herself to pieces, and what with the great noise of the sails, and the singing of the wind, and the flying of the spray in the moonlight, and the sense of danger, I think my head must have been partly turned, for I could scarcely understand the things I saw. Presently I observed Mr. Riach and the seamen busy round the skiff, and still in the same blank ran over to assist them and as soon as I set my hand to work, my mind came clear again. It was no very easy task, for the skiff lay amidships and was full of hamper, and the breaking of the heavier seas continually forced us to give over and hold on, but we all wrought like horses while we could. Meanwhile such of the wounded as could move came clambering out of the fore scuttle and began to help, while the rest that lay helpless in their bunks harrowed me with screaming and begging to be saved captain took no part. It seemed he was struck stupid. He stood holding by the shrouds, talking to himself and groaning out aloud whenever the ship hammered on the rock. His brig was like wife and child to him. He had looked on day by day at the mishandling of poor Ransom, but when it came to the brig he seemed to suffer along with her. All the time of our working at the boat I remember only one other thing that I asked Alan looking across at the shore, what country it was, and he answered, it was the worst possible for him, it was the land of the Campbells. We had one of the wounded men told off to keep a watch upon the seas and cry us warning. Well, we had the boat about ready to be launched, when this man sang out pretty shrill, "'For God's sake, hold on!' We knew by his tone that it was something more than ordinary 
and sure enough there followed a sea so huge that it lifted the brig right up and canted her over on her beam. Whether the cry came too late, or my hold was too weak, I know not, but at the sudden tilting of the ship I was cast clean over the bulwarks into the sea. I went down and drank my fill, and then came up, and got a blink of the moon, and then down again. They say a man sinks a third time for good. I cannot be made like other folk then, for I would not like to write how often I went down, or how often I came up again. All the while I was being hurled along, and beaten upon and choked, and then swallowed whole, and the thing was so distracting to my wits that I was neither sorry nor afraid. Presently I found I was holding to a spar, which helped me somewhat, and then all of a sudden I was in quiet water, and began to come to myself. It was the spare yard I had got hold of, and I was amazed to see how far I had travelled from the brig. I hailed her, indeed, but it was plain she was already out of cry. She was still holding together, but whether or not they had yet launched the boat, it was too far off and too low down to see. While I was hailing the brig, I spied a tract of water lying between us where no great waves came but which yet boiled white all over and bristled in the moon with rings and bubbles. Sometimes the whole tract swung to one side like the tail of a live serpent. Sometimes for a glimpse it would all disappear and then boil up again. What it was I had no guess, which for the time increased my fear of it, but I now know it must have been the roost or tide race which had carried me away so fast and tumbled me about so cruelly, and at last as if tired of that play, had flung out me and the spare yard upon its landward margin. I now lay quite becalmed, and began to feel that a man can die of cold as well as of drowning. The shores of Herod were close in. I could see in the moonlight the dots of heather and the sparkling of the mica in the rocks. Well, thought I to myself, if I cannot get as far as that it's strange. I had no skill of swimming and water being small in our neighbourhood, but when I laid hold upon the yard with both arms, and kicked out with both feet, I soon begun to find that I was moving. Hard work it was, and mortally slow, but in about an hour of kicking and splashing I had got well in between the points of a sandy bay surrounded by low hills. The sea was here quite quiet, there was no sound of any surf, the moon shone clear, and I thought in my heart I had never seen a place so desert and desolate. But it was dry land, and when at last it grew so shallow that I could leave the yard and wade ashore upon my feet, I cannot tell if I was more tired or more grateful. Both, at least, I was, tired as I never was before that night, and grateful to God as I trust I have been often, though never with more cause. End of chapter Chapter Fourteen of Kidnapped. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. Chapter Fourteen The Islet. With my stepping ashore I began the most unhappy part of my adventures. It was half-past twelve in the morning, and though the wind was broken by the land, it was a cold night. I dared not sit down, for I thought I should have frozen, but I took off my shoes and walked to and fro upon the sand, barefoot, and beating my breast with infinite weariness. There was no sound of man or cattle, not a cock crew, though it was about the hour of their first waking. Only the surf broke outside in the distance, which put me in mind of my perils and those of my friend. To walk by the sea at that hour of the morning, and in a place so desert-like and lonesome, struck me with a kind of fear. As soon as the day began to break I put on my shoes and climbed a hill, the ruggedest scramble I ever undertook, falling the whole way between big blocks of granite, or leaping from one to another. When I got to the top, the dawn was come. 
There was no sign of the brig which must have lifted from the reef and sunk. The boat, too, was nowhere to be seen. There was never a sail upon the ocean, and in what I could see of the land was neither house nor man. I was afraid to think what had befallen my shipmates, and afraid to look longer at so empty a scene. What with my wet clothes and weariness, and my belly that now began to ache with hunger, I had enough to trouble me without that. So I set off eastward along the south coast, hoping to find a house where I might warm myself, and perhaps get news of those I had lost. And at the worst I considered the sun would soon rise and dry my clothes. After a little my way was stopped by a creek or inlet of the sea, which seemed to run pretty deep into the land and as I had no means to get across, I must needs change my direction to go around the end of it. It was still the roughest kind of walking, indeed the whole, not only of Herod, but of the neighbouring part of Mull, which they call the Ross, is nothing but a jumble of granite rocks with heather in among. At first the creek kept narrowing, as I had looked to see, but presently to my surprise it began to widen out again. At this I scratched my head, but had still no notion of the truth, until at last I came to a rising ground, and it burst upon me all in a moment that I was cast upon a little barren isle, and cut off on every side by the salt seas. Indeed, as instead of the sun rising to dry me, it came on to rain, with a thick mist, so that my case was lamentable. I stood in the rain and shivered, and wondered what to do, till it occurred to me that perhaps the creek was fordable back I went to the narrowest point, and waded in, but not three yards from shore I plumped in head over ears, and if ever I was heard of more it was rather by God's grace than my own prudence. I was no wetter, for that could hardly be, but I was all the colder for this mishap, and having lost another hope was the more unhappy. And now all at once the yard came in my head. What had carried me through the roost would surely serve me to cross this little quiet creek in safety. With that I set off undaunted across the top of the isle, to fetch and carry it back. It was a weary tramp in all ways, and if hope had not buoyed me up, I must have cast myself down and given up. Whether with the sea salt or because I was growing fevered, I was distressed with thirst, and had to stop as I went and drink the peaty water out of the hags. I came to the bay at last, more dead than alive, and at the first glance I thought the yard was something farther out than when I left it. In I went, for the third time, into the sea. The sand was smooth and firm, and shelved gradually down, so that I could wade out till the water was almost to my neck, and little waves splashed into my face. But at that depth my feet began to leave me, and I durst venture in no farther. As for the yard, I saw it bobbing very quietly some twenty feet beyond. I had borne up well until this last disappointment, but at that I came ashore and flung myself down upon the sands and wept. The time I spent upon the island is still so horrible a thought to me that I must pass it lightly over. In all the books I have read of people cast away, they had either their pockets full of tools or a chest of things which would be thrown upon the beach along with them, as if on purpose. My case was very different. I had nothing in my pockets but money and Alan's silver button, and being inland-bred I was as much short of knowledge as of means. I knew indeed that shellfish were counted good to eat, and among the rocks of the isle I found a great plenty of limpets which at first I could hardly strike from their places, not knowing quickness to be needful. There were, besides, some of the little shells that we call buckies, I think periwinkle is the English name. Of these two I made my whole diet, devouring them cold and raw as I found them, and so hungry was I that at first they seemed to me delicious. Perhaps they were out of season, or perhaps there was something wrong in the sea about my island but at least I had no sooner eaten my first meal than I was seized with giddiness and retching, and lay for a long time no better than dead. A second trial of the same food, indeed I had no other, did better with me, and revived my strength. But as long as I was on the island I never knew what to expect when I had eaten. Sometimes all was well, and sometimes I was thrown into a miserable sickness, 
nor could I ever distinguish what particular fish it was that hurt me. All day it streamed rain. The island ran like a sop. There was no dry spot to be found, and when I lay down that night, between two boulders that made a kind of roof, my feet were in a bog. The second day I crossed the island to all sides. There was no one part of it better than another. It was all desolate and rocky, nothing living on it but game birds which I lacked the means to kill, and gulls which haunted the outlying rocks in a prodigious number. But the creek, or strait, that cut off the isle from the mainland of the Ross, opened out on the north into a bay, and the bay again opened into the sound of Iona, and it was the neighbourhood of this place that I chose to be my home, though if I had thought upon the very name of home in such a spot, I must have burst out weeping. I had good reasons for my choice. There was in this part of the isle a little hut of a house like a pig's hut, where fishers used to sleep when they came there upon their business, but the turf roof of it had fallen entirely in, so that the hut was of no use to me, and gave me less shelter than my rocks. What was more important, the shellfish on which I lived grew there in great plenty. When the tide was out I could gather a peck at a time, and this was doubtless a convenience. But the other reason went deeper. I had become in no way used to the horrid solitude of the isle, but still looked round me on all sides, like a man that was hunted, between fear and hope that I might see some human creature coming. Now from a little up the hillside over the bay, I could catch a sight of the great ancient church and the roofs of the people's houses in Iona. And on the other hand, over the low country of the Ross, I saw smoke go up morning and evening, as if from a homestead in the hollow of the land. I used to watch this smoke when I was wet and cold, and had my head half turned with loneliness, and I think of the fireside and the company till my heart burned. It was the same with the roofs of Iona. Altogether, this sight I had of men's homes and comfortable lives, although it put a point on my own sufferings, yet it kept hope alive, and helped me to eat my raw shellfish, which had soon grown to be a disgust, and saved me from the sense of horror I had whenever I was quite alone with dead rocks and fowls and the rain and the cold sea. I say it kept hope alive and indeed it seemed impossible that I should be left to die on the shores of my own country, and within view of a church tower and the smoke of men's houses. But the second day passed, and though as long as the light lasted I kept a bright lookout for boats on the sound, or men passing on the Ross, no help came near me. It still rained, and I turned into sleep as wet as ever, and with a cruel sore throat, but a little comforted, perhaps, by having said good-night to my next neighbours, the people of Iona. Charles the Second declared a man could stay outdoors more days in the year in the climate of England than in any other. This was very like a king, with a palace at his back and changes of dry clothes, but he must have had better luck on his flight from Worcester than I had in that miserable isle. It was the height of the summer, yet it rained for more than twenty-four hours it did not clear until the afternoon of the third day. This was the day of incidents. In the morning I saw a red deer, a buck with a fine spread of antlers, standing in the rain on the top of the island, but he had scarce seen me rise from my rock before he trotted off upon the other side. I supposed he must have swum the strait, though what should bring any creature to Arid was more than I could fancy. A little after, as I was jumping about after my limpets, I was startled by a guinea-piece, which fell upon a rock in front of me and glanced off into the sea. When the sailors gave me my money again, they kept back not only about a third of the whole sum, but my father's leather purse, so that from that day out I carried my gold loose in a pocket with a button. I now saw there must be a hole, and clapped my hand to the place in a great hurry but this was to lock the stable door after the steed was stolen. I had left the shore at Queen's Ferry with near on fifty pounds. Now I found no more than two guinea pieces and a silver shilling. It is true I picked up a third guinea a little after, where it lay shining on a piece of turf. That made a fortune of three pounds and four shillings English money, 
for a lad the rightful heir of an estate now starving on an isle at the extreme end of the wild highlands the state of my affairs dashed me still further and indeed my plight on that third morning was truly pitiful my clothes were beginning to rot my stockings in particular were quite worn through so that my shanks went naked my hands had grown quite soft with the continual soaking my throat was very sore my strength had much abated and my heart so turned against the horrid stuff i was condemned to eat that the very sight of it came near to sicken me and yet the worst was not yet come there is a pretty high rock on the northwest of Herod, which because it had a flat top and overlooked the sound i was much in the habit of frequenting not that ever i stayed in one place save when asleep my misery giving me no rest indeed i wore myself down with continual and aimless goings and comings in the rain as soon however as the sun came out i lay down on the top of that rock to dry myself the comfort of the sunshine is a thing i cannot tell it set me thinking hopefully of my deliverance of which i had begun to despair and i scanned the sea and the ross with a fresh interest on the south of my rock a part of the island jutted out and hid the open ocean so that a boat could thus come quite near me upon that side and i'd be none the wiser well all of a sudden a cobble with a brown sail and a pair of fishers aboard of it came flying round that corner of the isle bound for iona i shouted out and then fell on my knees on the rock and reached up my hands and prayed to them they were near enough to hear i could even see the colour of their hair and there was no doubt but they observed me for they cried out in the gaelic tongue and laughed but the boat never turned aside and flew on right before my eyes for iona i could not believe such wickedness and ran along the shore from rock to rock crying on them piteously even after they were out of reach of my voice i still cried and waved to them and when they were quite gone i thought my heart would have burst all the time of my troubles i wept only twice once when i could not reach the yard and now the second time when these fishers turned a deaf ear to my cries but this time i wept and roared like a wicked child tearing up the turf with my nails and grinding my face in the earth if a wish would kill men those two fishers would never have seen morning and i should likely have died upon my island when i was a little over my anger i must eat again but with such loathing of the mess as i could now scarce control sure enough i should have done as well to fast for my fishes poisoned me again I had all my first pains my throat was so sore i could scarce swallow i had a fit of strong shuddering which clucked my teeth together and there came on me that dreadful sense of illness which we have no name for either in scotch or english i thought i should have died and made my peace with god forgiving all men even my uncle and the fishers and as soon as i had thus made up my mind to the worst clearness came upon me I observed the night was falling dry my clothes were dried a good deal truly i was in a better case than ever before since i had landed on the isle and so i got to sleep at last with a thought of gratitude the next day which was the fourth of this horrible life of mine i found my bodily strength run very low but the sun shone the air was sweet and what i managed to eat of the shellfish agreed well with me and revived my courage I was scarce back on my rock, where I went always the first thing after I had eaten, before I observed a boat coming down the sound, and with her head, as I thought, in my direction. I began at once to hope and fear exceedingly, for I thought these men might have thought better of their cruelty and be coming back to my assistance. But another disappointment, such as yesterday's, was more than I could bear. I turned my back accordingly upon the sea and did not look again till i had counted many hundreds the boat was still heading for the island the next time i counted the full thousand as slowly as i could my heart beating so as to hurt me and then it was out of all question she was coming straight to arid i could no longer hold myself back but ran to the seaside and out from one rock to another as far as i could go 
It is a marvel I was not drowned, for when I was brought to a stand at last, my legs shook under me, and my mouth was so dry I must wet it with the sea-water before I was able to shout. All this time the boat was coming on, and now I was able to perceive it was the same boat and the same two men as yesterday. This I knew by their hair, which the one had of a bright yellow and the other black, but now there was a third man along with them, who looked to be of a better class. As soon as they were come within easy speech, they let down their sail and lay quiet. In spite of my supplications they drew no nearer in, and what frightened me most of all, the new man tee-heed with laughter as he talked and looked at me. Then he stood up in the boat and addressed me a long while, speaking fast and with many wavings of his hand. I told him I had no Gaelic, and at this he became very angry, and I began to suspect he thought he was talking English. Listening very close, I caught the word, What heifer? several times, but all the rest was Gaelic and might have been Greek and Hebrew for me. Whatever, said I, to show him I had caught a word. Yes, 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 says he, and then he looked at the other men, as much as to say, I told you I spoke English, and began again as hard as ever in the Gaelic. This time I picked out another word, tied. Then I had a flash of hope. I remembered he was always waving his hand towards the mainland of the Ross. "'Do you mean when the tide is out?' I cried, and could not finish. "'Yes, yes,' said he. "'Tide!' At that I turned tail upon their boat, where my adviser had once more begun to tee-hee with laughter, leaped back the way I had come, from one stone to another, and set off running across the isle as I had never run before. In about half an hour I came out upon the shores of the creek, and sure enough it was shrunk into a little trickle of water, through which I dashed, not above my knees, and landed with a shout on the main island. A sea-bred boy would not have stayed a day on Arid, which is only what they call a tidal islet, and except in the bottom of the neeps, can be entered and left twice in every twenty-four hours, either dry-shod or at the most by wading. Even I, who had the tide going out and in before me in the bay, and even watched for the ebbs, the better to get my shellfish, even I, I say, if I had sat down to think, instead of raging at my fate, must have soon guessed the secret and got free. It was no wonder the fishers had not understood me. The wonder was whether they had ever guessed my pitiful illusion and taken the trouble to come back. I had starved with cold and hunger on that island for close upon one hundred hours, but for the fishers I might have left my bones there, in pure folly, and even as it was I had paid for it pretty dear, not only in past sufferings but in my present case, being clothed like a beggar-man, scarce able to walk, and in great pain of my sore throat. I have seen wicked men and fools, a great many of both, and I believe they both get paid in the end but the fools first. End of chapter. Chapter 15 of Kidnapped This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson Chapter 15 The Lad with a Silver Button Through the Isle of Mull The Ross of Mull, which I had now got upon, was rugged and trackless, like the isle I had just left, being all bog and briar and big stone. There may be roads for them that know that country well, but for my part I had no better guide than my own nose, and no other landmark than Ben Moore. I aimed as well as I could for the smoke I had seen so often from the island, and with all my great weariness and the difficulty of the way came upon the house in the bottom of a little hollow about five or six at night. It was low and longish, roofed with turf and built of unmortared stones, and on a mound in front of it an old gentleman sat smoking his pipe in the sun. With what little English he had he gave me to understand that my shipmates had got safe ashore 
and had broken bread in that very house on the day after. "'Was there one?' I asked. "'Dressed like a gentleman?' He said they all wore rough greatcoats, but to be sure the first of them, the one that came alone, wore breeches and stockings, while the rest had sailors' trousers. "'Ah!' said I. "'And he would have a feathered hat?' He told me no, that he was bareheaded like myself. At first I thought Alan might have lost his hat, and then the rain came in my mind, and I judged it more likely he had it out of harm's way under his greatcoat. This set me smiling, partly because my friend was safe, partly to think of his vanity in dress. And then the old gentleman clapped his hand to his brow, and cried out that I must be the lad with the silver button. "'Why, yes,' said I, in some wonder. "'Well, then,' said the old gentleman, "'I have a word for you, that you are to follow your friend to his country by Torosay. He then asked me how I had fared, and I told him my tale. A South Country man would certainly have laughed, but this old gentleman, I call him so because of his manners, for his clothes were dropping off his back, heard me all through with nothing but gravity and pity. When I had done, he took me by the hand, led me into his hut, it was no better, and presented me before his wife, as if she had been the queen and I a duke. The good woman set oat-bread before me in a cold grouse, patting my shoulder and smiling to me all the time, for she had no English, and the old gentleman, not to be behind, brewed me a strong punch out of their country spirit. All the while I was eating, and after that when I was drinking the punch, I could scarce come to believe in my good fortune, and the house, though it was thick with the peat smoke and as full of holes as a colander, seemed like a palace. The punch threw me in a strong sweat and a deep slumber. The good people let me lie, and it was near noon of the next day before I took the road, my throat already easier, and my spirits quite restored by good fare and good news. The old gentleman, though I pressed him hard, would take no money, and gave me an old bonnet for my head, though I am free to own I was no sooner out of view of the house than I very jealously washed this gift of his in a wayside fountain. Thought I to myself, if these are the wild highlanders I could wish my own folk wilder. I not only started late, but I must have wandered nearly half the time. True, I met plenty of people grubbing in little miserable fields that would not keep a cat, or herding little kine about the bigness of asses. The highland dress being forbidden by law since the rebellion, and the people condemned to the lowland habit, which they much disliked, it was strange to see the variety of their array. Some went bare only for a hanging cloak or great coat, and carried their trousers on their backs like a useless burden. Some had made an imitation of the tartan with little party-coloured stripes, patched together like an old wife's quilt. Others, again, still wore the highland philobeg, but by putting a few stitches between the legs transformed it into a pair of trousers like a Dutchman's. All those makeshifts were condemned and punished, for the law was harshly applied, in hopes to break up the clan spirit, but in that out-of-the-way, sea-bound isle there were few to make remarks, and fewer to tell tales. They seemed in great poverty, which was no doubt natural, now that rapine was put down, and the chiefs kept no longer an open house, and the roads, even such a wandering country by-track as the one I followed, were infested with beggars. And here again I marked a difference from my own part of the country, for our lowland beggars, even the gownsmen themselves, who begged by patent, had a louding, flattering way with them, and if you gave them a plaque and asked changed, would very civilly return you a bottle. But these highland beggars stood on their dignity, asked alms only to buy snuff, by their account, and would give no change. To be sure, this was no concern of mine, except in so far as it entertained me by the way. What was much more to the purpose, few had any English, and these few, unless they were of the brotherhood of beggars, not very anxious to place it at my service. I knew Torosay to be my destination, and repeated the name to them, and pointed. But instead of simply pointing in reply, they would give me a screed of the Gaelic that set me foolish, so it was small wonder if I went out of my road as often as I stayed in it. 
At last, about eight at night, and already very weary, I came to a lone house, where I asked admittance and was refused, until I bethought me of the power of money in so poor a country, and held up one of my guineas in my finger and thumb. Thereupon the man of the house, who had hitherto pretended to have no English, and driven me from his door by signals, suddenly began to speak as clearly as was needful, and agreed for five shillings to give me a night's lodging, and guide me the next day to Torresay. I slept uneasily that night, fearing I should be robbed, but I might have spared myself the pain, for my host was no robber, only miserably poor and a great cheat. He was not alone in his poverty, for the next morning we must go five miles about to the house of what he called a rich man, to have one of my guineas changed. This was perhaps a rich man for Mull, he would have scarce been thought so in the South, for it took all he had. The whole house was turned upside down, and a neighbour brought under contribution, before he could scrape together twenty shillings in silver. The odd shilling he kept for himself, protesting he could ill afford to have so great a sum of money lying locked up. For all that he was very curious and well-spoken, made us both sit down with his family to dinner, and brewed punch in a fine china bowl over which my rascal guy grew so merry that he refused to start. I was for getting angry, and appealed to the rich man, Hector MacLean was his name, who had been a witness to our bargain and to my payment of the five shillings. But MacLean had taken his share of the punch, and vowed that no gentleman should leave his table after the bowl was brewed, so there was nothing for it but to sit and hear Jacobite toast and Gaelic songs till all were tipsy, and staggered off to the bed or the barn for their night's rest. Next day, the fourth of my travels, we were up before five upon the clock, but my rascal guide got to the bottle at once, and it was three hours before I had him clear of the house, and then, as you shall hear, only for a worse disappointment. As long as we went down a heathery valley that lay before Mr. McLean's house, all went well. Only my guide looked constantly over his shoulder, and when I asked him the cause, only grinned at me. No sooner, however, had we crossed the back of a hill and got out of sight of the house windows, than he told me Torosay lay right in front, and that a hilltop, which he pointed out, was my best landmark. "'I care very little for that,' said I, since you are going with me." The impotent cheat answered me in the Gaelic that he had no English. "'My fine fellow,' I said, "'I know very well your English comes and goes. Tell me what will bring it back. Is it more money you wish?' Five shillings more,' said he, "'and herself will bring you there.' I reflected a while, and then offered him two, which he accepted greedily, and insisted on having in his hands at once, for luck, as he said, but I think it was rather for my misfortune." The two shillings carried him not quite as many miles, at the end of which distance he sat down upon the wayside, and took off his brogues from his feet, like a man about to rest. I was now red-hot. "'Ha!' said I. "'Have you no more English?' He said impudently, "'No.' At that I boiled over, and lifted my hand to strike him, and he, drawing a knife from his rags, squatted back and grinned at me like a wildcat. At that, forgetting everything but my anger, I ran in upon him, put aside his knife with my left, and struck him in the mouth with the right. I was a strong lad, and very angry, and he but a little man, and he went down before me heavily. By good luck his knife flew out of his hand as he fell. I picked up both that and his brogues, wished him a good morning, and set off upon my way, leaving him barefoot and disarmed. I chuckled to myself as I went being sure I was done with that rogue, for a variety of reasons. First, he knew he could have no more of my money. Next, the brogues were worth in that country only a few pence. And lastly, the knife, which was really a dagger, it was against the law for him to carry. In about half an hour of walk, I overtook a great ragged man, moving pretty fast but feeling before him with a staff. He was quite blind, and told me he was a catechist, which should have put me at my ease. But his face went against me. It seemed dark, and dangerous, and secret. And presently, as we began to go on alongside, 
I saw the steel butt of a pistol sticking from under the flap of his coat-pocket. To carry such a thing meant a fine of fifteen pounds sterling upon a first offence, and transportation to the colonies upon a second. Nor could I quite see why a religious teacher should go armed, or what a blind man could be doing with a pistol. I told him about my guide, for I was proud of what I had done, and my vanity for once got the heels of my prudence. At the mention of the five shillings he cried out so loud that I made up my mind I should say nothing of the other two, and was glad he could not see my blushes. "'Was it too much?' I asked, a little faltering. "'Too much!' cries he. "'Why, I would guide you to Torosay myself for a dram of brandy, and give you the great pleasure of my company, me that is a man of some learning, in the bargain.' I said I did not see how a blind man could be a guide, but at that he laughed aloud, and said his stick was eyes enough for an eagle. "'In the Isle of Mull, at least,' says he, "'where I know every stone and heather-bush by mark of head. See now,' he said, striking right and left, as if to make sure, "'down there a burn is running, and at the head of it there stands a bit of a small hill with a stone cocked upon the top of that.' and it's hard at the foot of the hill that the way runs by to Torosay, and the way here, being for droves, is plainly trodden, and will show grassy through the heather. I had to own he was right in every feature, and told my wonder. Ha! says he, that's nothing. Would you believe me now, that before the act came out, and when there were weapons in this country, I could shoot? Ay, could I? cries he, and then with a leer. If you had such a thing as a pistol here to try with, I would show you how it's done." I told him I had nothing of the sort, and gave him a wider berth. If he had known, his pistol stuck at that time quite plainly out of his pocket, and I could see the sun twinkle on the steel of the butt. But by the better luck for me he knew nothing, thought all was covered, and lied on in the dark. He then began to question me cunningly, where I came from, whether I was rich whether I could change a five-shilling piece for him, which he declared he had that moment in his sporan, and all the time he kept edging up to me, and I avoiding him. We were now upon a sort of green cattle-track which crossed the hills towards Torosay, and we kept changing sides upon that like answers in a reel. I had so plainly the upper hand that my spirits rose, and indeed I took a pleasure in this game of blind man's bluff but the catechist grew angrier and angrier, and at last began to swear in Gaelic and to strike for my legs with his staff. Then I told him that, sure enough, I had a pistol in my pocket as well as he, and if he did not strike across the hill due south, I would even blow his brains out. He became at once very polite, and after trying to soften me for some time, but quite in vain, he cursed me once more in Gaelic and took himself off. I watched him striding along, through bog and briar, tapping with his stick, until he turned the end of a hill and disappeared in the next hollow. Then I struck on again for Torosay, much better pleased to be alone than to travel with that man of learning. This was an unlucky day, and these two, of whom I had just rid myself, one after the other, were the two worst men I met with in the highlands. At Torosay, on the sound of Mull, and looking over to the mainland of Morven, there was an inn with an innkeeper, who was a Maclean, it appeared, of a very high family, for to keep an inn is thought even more genteel in the highlands than it is with us, perhaps as partaking of hospitality, or perhaps because the trade is idle and drunken. He spoke good English, and finding me to be something of a scholar, tried me first in French, where he easily beat me, and then in the Latin in which I don't know which of us did best. This pleasant rivalry put us at once upon friendly terms, and I sat up and drank punch with him, or, to be more correct, sat up and watched him drink it, until he was so tipsy that he wept upon my shoulder. I tried him, as if by accident, with the sight of Alan's button, but it was plain he had never seen or heard of it. Indeed he bore some grudge against the family and friends of Ardshiel, and before he was drunk he read me a lampoon, in very good Latin, but with a very ill meaning, which he had made in elegiac verses upon a person of that house. 
When I told him of my catechist, he shook his head, and said I was lucky to have got clear off. "'That is a very dangerous man,' he said. "'Duncan McKee is his name. He can shoot by the ear at several yards, and he has often been accused of highway robberies, and once of murder.' "'The cream of it is,' says I, "'that he called himself a catechist.' "'And why should he not?' says he when that is what he is. It was Maclean of Duart gave it to him before he was blind. But perhaps it was a pity, says my host, for he is always on the road, going from one place to another to hear the young folk say their religion, and doubtless that is a great temptation to the poor man. At last, when my landlord could drink no more, he showed me to a bed, and I lay down in a very good spirits, having travelled the greater part of that big and crooked island of Mull, from Arid to Torosay, fifty miles as the crow flies, and, with my wanderings, much nearer a hundred, in four days and with little fatigue. Indeed I was by far in better heart and health of body at the end of that long tramp than I had been at the beginning. End of chapter.